But these events, momentous and exciting as they undoubtedly were, did not seriously disturb either my mother or me. We were too much occupied with each other. She was only a girl, and I was her first baby, the first of ten. She and I were thus navigating strange seas and exploring new worlds together. I first came across F.W. Boreham several years ago when someone invited me to have whatever books that appealed to me from the personal library of a deceased Methodist minister. I saw on his shelf an old book by F.W. Boreham. I'd heard some old timers talk of Boreham but I'd not up until this time ever read one of his books. I took that particular book and it sat on my library shelf for months before I read it. When I eventually did pick it up I had never read anything like it. Boreham went on for 30 pages about the virtues of wet paint. But then, from seemingly nowhere, he linked all of those virtues to make one of the most profound spiritual insights I'd ever read. I sat there stunned with the book on my lap as if I'd just received the benefit of grandfather's accumulated wisdom in just one essay addressed to me. Since then, I've collected nearly all of F.W. Boreham's books and writings, but the more interested I became in his writings, the more interested I became in him. Salvos of artillery and peals of bells echoed across Europe on the morning of my birth. Some men, situated as I was, would have taken it for granted that those thunderous reverberations and melodious carillons had been specially organised in their honour. Incredible as it must seem, however, I was in those days so extremely modest that no such thoughts occurred to me. I discovered afterwards, long afterwards, that my advent synchronised exactly with the dramatic termination of the Franco-Prussian War. On Friday, March the 3rd, 1871, an hour before my arrival, the Prussian troops that had held Paris in a cruel stranglehold commenced the evacuation of the capital. But these events, momentous and exciting as they undoubtedly were, did not seriously disturb either my mother or me. We were too much occupied with each other. She was only a girl, and I was her first baby, the first of ten. She and I were thus navigating strange seas and exploring new worlds together. Frank William Boreham was born in Garden Road, Tunbridge Wells in Kent, about an hour's train ride south of London, to Francis and Fanny Boreham on Friday, March 3, 1871. Soon after he was born, he and his parents moved into the house his father had just built, which would remain in the Boreham family for four generations. His father named their new home at 134 Grosvenor Road, Roxton Lodge. His 24-year-old father, Mr. Francis Boreham, worked as a clerk for a solicitor's firm in Church Road. His career there would span some 60 years. He and his wife Fanny were devoutly religious, having first met at, then married in, St. John's Anglican Church. In the 1800s, Tunbridge Wells was often frequented by gypsies. F.W. Boreham's biographer, Howard Crago, tells us that one sunny July afternoon in 1871, a nurse girl sat by the roadside a mile or so out of Tunbridge Wells along the Southborough Road, allowing the four-month-old baby in her lap to enjoy the sunshine. 
Hearing the crunch of wheels along the road, the girl looked up from her petticoated bundle to see a gypsy caravan just coming around the bend. Alongside the caravan trudged an old gypsy woman, leaning heavily upon a pair of sticks, her snow-white hair crowning a swarthy face. Walking across to where the girl was seated, this strange old crone looked into the baby's face and then picked up his tiny hand, turning it over under her intent gaze. Tell his mother, she said to the nurse, to put a pen in his hand and he'll never want for a living. The old gypsy went her way, but she could never have known how remarkably her prophecy was fulfilled. Infected partly, I suppose, by the evident reverence and affection with which my parents regarded the beautiful church on the hill, the first sight of it invariably sent a little thrill through all my frame. I was tremendously impressed by its stately appearance, its tapering spire, its shapely pillars, its carved pulpit of white stone, its storied windows, and its ornate and solemn services. We were always taught that it was an awful thing to come in late, as though we gave our time grudgingly to worship. I can recall no single occasion on which such a disaster befell us. A care was always taken that we should be in our places some minutes before the minister issued from the vestry door. And no one dreamed of stirring at the end of the service until the preacher had again retired to that seclusion. But even though the young Borum was religiously in church each Sunday with his parents and family, he was far from being a converted Christian. This great transaction was yet several years away. But that is as far as it went. <laughs> I was no better, if no worse, than the average boy. And when I appeared to be following the sermon with exemplary intentness, I was very often engaged in planning the paper chases or thinking out the cricket arrangements for the coming week. For the young Borum, there were two defining moments that played an immeasurable role in shaping who he was to become. Borum would never know about this event that happened, except for the fact that his mother repeatedly told it to him. It was when the family nanny took Borum for a stroll through the Tunbridge Commons that as she was taking him through the park in a pram, a gypsy lady came over to her as the nanny took Borum out of the pram and nursed him on her lap in the sun, the gypsy came over to her, picked up Borum's hand and held it, looked straight into the eyes of the nanny and said, tell his mother, put a pen in his hand and he'll want for nothing. Little could she have known the profound impact of that prophecy. The second event was witnessed by Frank as a boy and it had a lifelong lingering effect upon him. Every child of Christian parents comes to that point in their own life where they choose to make the faith of their parents their own or they give that faith back, that borrowed faith, back to their parents, so to speak. That might have happened to F.W. Borum if it wasn't for something he saw that had a lingering effect upon him. Whenever I entered my grandfather's room without his being aware of my approach, he was almost invariably sitting at the table near the window, poring over the well-worn pages of his big Bible, and he evidently read, not as a duty, but as a delight. I said nothing, and he said nothing, but it set me thinking. I occasionally read the Bible because I was told to do so. But to read the Bible for the sheer joy of it, this was something that passed my comprehension. And I spent a good deal of time in puzzling over the problem that it presented. F.W. Borum tells the story of his mother going to Canterbury Cathedral to meet with a friend, where together they were going to tour the historic building. After waiting for several hours, she was approached by an older distinguished gentleman who offered to take her on a guided tour of the old building 
He assured her that he was very familiar with the church. At the end of the impromptu tour, he asked if they could exchange cards. Fanny didn't have a card. Undaunted, the man gave her his card. It wasn't until she got home that she actually looked at the card. It simply read, Charles Dickens. And that's one reason Mother used to add why I am so fond of reading to you the stories of Paul Dombey and Little Nell and Tom Pinch and Pip and Oliver Twist and all the rest of them. You understand now, don't you? We understood.